Uh, I'm uh, Kevin Rudd. Um, I'm from Queensland and I'm still here to help. At what point when you were growing up did you realise that you wanted to pursue a career in diplomacy and politics? Uh, probably about the age of 15. I remember then writing to the um, uh, Prime Minister and Acting Foreign Minister of Australia, a guy called E.G. Whitlam, and said, um, uh, Dear Goff, um, I'm a 15-year-old attending Nambour State High School in Queensland. I'd like to become a diplomat. What should I do? Yours sincerely, Kevin Rudd. Handwritten note. And so in due course, he wrote back, uh, which is uh, quite nice of him, given that he was prime minister, signed letter saying, I really think you should go to university and you should study a foreign language. Um, so um, that kind of began the idea, if you like. So age of 15, as a high school student, corresponding with the then foreign minister of the country. What was your biggest takeaway from working as an Australian diplomat? What, what did you learn out of that experience? Well, the important thing at university is to um, follow your uh, heart's desire because uh, whatever you like doing, you're going to be best at. So in my case, I had an interest in China and so I pursued that. I uh, did not have the opportunity to study Chinese uh, language or history at high school. Uh, so I took it um, as a, a ground level course at the Australian National University, then graduated and then uh, rediscovered uh, the wisdom which was imparted to me by Gough Whitlam much earlier on, which was uh, why not apply to become an Australian diplomat. So what did I learn from all of that? Um, in terms of the years I then spent in the foreign service, both working in embassies in Europe uh, and in uh, Asia, uh, principally in China, um, I learned that uh, as a diplomat, um, your uh, added value to the country uh, lies, first of all, in being an accurate analyst of what's going on in Australia's environment, um, to identify changes um, uh, which either present opportunities or threats to the enduring Australian national interests of national security, national economic advancement, um, as well as um, uh, what we do to uh, sustain the rules-based order. But your second responsibility, I think I learned this over a period of time, is not just to describe, uh, it is to advise on what this country should do about those opportunities and threats. And so um, that puts you directly in the line of policy work, as opposed to what you describe as just analytical work. And I'd encourage young people as they think about Australia's future in the world, not to simply be describers or analysts, uh, but to think clearly uh, through the big questions of what Australia must now do to carve out its future in an uncertain regional and global environment. What, what do you see as um, being a, a key part of that? Um, new global environment where you know young aspirational diplomats, maybe the 15 year olds of today, uh, may be working in, in 30 years time. Where do you see sort of international relations and international affairs heading in that period of time? If we're casting our eyes out for the next quarter of a century, for example, um, I think it's important to assume that the certainties that we've known for the last three quarters of a century since the end of the last world war are beginning to come unstuck. Um, there is an open question about uh, America's future global world, a global or a role, um, whether it will continue to be the linchpin of the global rules-based system or not. And certainly the Trump presidency has been an uncomfortable harbinger of uh, things which may still come. I think the second um, uh, element in this uncertain future world uh, is that Anyone who assumes that a replacement global order led by China will be, by definition, benign in Australia's national interests uh, is uh, smoking something. Um, the smart thing to do uh, is to look very carefully at the essence of this Marxist-Leninist state and work out our terms of coexistence with that Marxist-Leninist state rather than having romantic delusions 
that it would be in the interests of a, an advanced liberal democracy like Australia to be part and parcel of a Chinese-led international system. And I think the third thing to think through is, let's call it the machinery of global governance. You see, uh, when you look at the institutions of global governance, either through the United Nations, its various um, subsidiary bodies, World Trade Organization, International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank, the G20, all these institutions of which Australia is a member, as they begin to be pulled apart by the competing geopolitical tensions of China in one quarter and the Americans in the other, it'll be very important for like-minded, uh, open economies, open societies, open political systems like Australia, like Canada, uh, like Japan, uh, like the Republic of Korea, uh, like France, Germany, Britain, and what I describe as a collectivity of middle powers around the world to cohere in support of the critical institutions of global governance, irrespective of what great power politics is doing. So my encouragement to you as you look out for the next 25 years is to prepare yourselves intellectually uh, and in um, policy, critical policy terms, for those three large mission statements which loom. And finally, looming up the middle of all of them is the fundamental existential question of climate change, which has an ability to wash across the top in the absence of effective global collaboration. Where do you think that nation states and, and countries and the sort of international diplomacy has failed in trying to address climate change? Where, where do you see that failure at the moment? Well, bear in mind that in Europe, for example, most um, uh, of the countries of Europe are united in a common resolve to act on climate change. So this is not a universal condition across the international family. Uh, countries like the United States and the Republicans have decided, decided to step off the planet and to somehow um, argue the proposition that, um, uh, that climate change is either a hoax, uh, not founded in science, or it's simply just too damn politically inconvenient to act for fear that it would compromise your economic interests. Um, and then of course you have Australia under the current conservative government following a similar suit. So why do I think it's uh, turned out that way? Never underestimate the power of the media in what you're doing, the power of the Murdoch media. And Rupert Murdoch has been one of the leading global climate change denialists for the better part of the last decade and a half. And whether you're looking at the mainstream British newspapers, uh, Fox Television, the United States, uh, the 70% of Australian print circulation controlled by Murdoch, their common mantra for 15 years has been climate change is a scientific hoax. No re a responsible nation state will take economic uh, policy measures to act on it uh, because if you do so, you will undermine your national economic competitiveness. So this huge media force up the middle of the American, Australian and British uh, political systems uh, has had a measurable effect. And furthermore, it's, it's hijacked the conservative side of politics in the English speaking world, um, with the partial exception of the United Kingdom, where there is more media diversity hijacked um, the uh, conservative side of politics in the direction of climate change denialism. So if you were to look at the analysis today, Europe wants to act. Most of the other advanced democracies wish to act. China even is slowly acting. And the denialists uh, are actually rampant in the United States and Australia, who continue to undermine global consensus for further global action. What, what role do you see organisations like the United Nations playing in, in fixing that? Do you think that they can or do you think that it's limited to the domestic policy or politics of individual countries? Well, remember, what uh, the United Nations does is it's the repository for international treaty law. And within treaty law, you have the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, you have the uh, various instrumentalities which exist underneath that, including the Paris Agreement of 2015. Now, these are framework agreements, um, but in order to give them effect, they establish um, uh, normative uh, targets, in our case, uh, to bring about sufficient greenhouse gas reductions uh, by mid-century to prevent 
average temperature increases going in excess of 1.5 degrees centigrade by centuries end. But that is only given effect then by uh, national programs to reduce carbon emissions, either through energy efficiency measures or by uh, reducing coal-fired power stations or fossil fuel powered um, transportation and bringing about uh, renewable energy uh, transformation. And these are all national measures. The United Nations doesn't mandate that you do these things, but the United Nations through treaty arrangements says, this is what we all need to do and have agreed to do as nation states in order to keep a lid on global temperature increases going through the roof. So it's like international law. It's only as good as individual nation states choose to get, uh, allow it to have effect. And if you look at the news in the last 24 hours, it is for me repugnant that the Australian government um, has, uh, simp has indicated that for the current Paris Agreement, it will not provide uh, any new uh, national targets for Australia to bring down its emissions by um, in this <clears throat> year 2020, despite the fact that the Paris Agreement mandates that all nation states in the year 2020 will provide a new set of commitments for the period ahead. So Australia is walking away in effect from its, uh, its global commitments. Just finally, there's a lot, of, a lot of angst among young people in Australia at the moment around the sort of the coronavirus recession uh, that's sort of looming ahead of us. How do you think Australia should position itself to better, I guess, um, help younger people moving into the future? Um, recessions are not unique in this country's history. Um, uh, when I left university in the early 80s, we were in the middle of a recession. Uh, unemployment was double digits. Um, in the early 90s, we had another recession. Um, and as you know, during the global financial crisis, the actions of my government prevented a recession. Uh, that was about 10 years or so ago. And now we face this one, which is a large scale recession uh, globally. The good news is economies recover. That's the good news. Uh, the responsibility of government during the recovery period is to provide sufficient support for young people who can't yet secure a job uh, to put them on a living wage uh, in order to support themselves while they obtain further skills for when the economy recovers. And the two things are inseparable. Everyone has got to live and live with a level of decency and dignity, point one. But point two, for young people, um, I would take any downtime you've got on your hands to develop another set of skills. It may be consistent with this conversation that you decide that if you're going to not be able to comfortably secure a job for the next 12 months or 18 months, learn Mandarin Chinese, learn Indonesian, pick up another skill. Um, and, uh, or if it's in other domains of life, pick up those other essential skills as well. That's what I'd be doing, but government has to play its part. Kevin Rudd, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to, to have a chat with us here at UNU. Uh, good on you, UNU. So keep supporting the cause. Uh, you've always criticised the United Nations system, but it reminds me of uh, Churchill's uh, reflections on democracy. Uh, democracy is the worst system of government in the world, uh, except for all the others. Uh, the United Nations is the worst system of international government in the world, except for all the others. That's why it's worth backing.